We're starting a series today that I've never taught. I've never really heard any teaching on it. And we titled this message or this series, The Culture Clash or Culture Clash. And the title of this message in the series is Culture Trumps Everything. So throughout this message, I'm gonna attempt to define what culture is and what it's not, so that when you leave it today, you'll understand what the clash is really about, what the fight is over. So culture has become a buzzword in different circles, especially when it comes to business. Every good leader wants to make sure they have a healthy culture, and that's not a bad thing. It's been said culture trumps everything. Culture can make or break you, culture is all that invisible stuff that glues organizations and families together. Culture is not what we say, but what we do without asking. For example, you and I, and, or you and some friends are walking into a library and you're talking and you're laughing, but when you enter, what do you do? <laughs> it's so funny, every service done the same thing. You hear people go, shh or be quiet. Every service done the same thing. That's culture. We don't have, I didn't, I didn't even, when I wrote this out, I just put a question mark, I, I had the answer, but I didn't even put the answer. I said, God, people will know the answer because that's the culture of the library. For whatever reason, the culture is when you go into the library, you don't talk, you don't talk out loud. If you even whisper sometimes, they tell you to be quiet. It's a place where you're quiet and you're reverent and you, you so people can study or, or you know, concentrate. That's culture. See, that's culture. Culture is a word for the way of life of groups of people, meaning the way they do things. This is what we do at Christmas. We have our own culture. In New Mexico, Christmas, Thanksgiving, if you're making turkey dinner at all, if you're making potatoes, in our culture, we, we use red chili instead of gravy. Come on, right? If you go to New York, they won't know what that is, because that's our culture. We have a culture in New Mexico. This is how we deal with things in our family. Where I work, at our church, we have a culture here. Culture really does trump everything. Our cultural values and beliefs manifest themselves through our lifestyle, we see it. Our cultural values influence how we approach living. Culture shapes our thinking, our behavior, our personalities. I believe culture can become our norm or what's normal to us. Even if it's not normal to anybody else, it's normal to us. The culture today, what's allowed, what is called normal, is much different than when I grew up. When I was at college at NMSU, I'd have friends and they would come to me and we'd be talking and, then, and sooner or later one of them would say, hey man, you know what I'm gonna do? And was like, what? I'm gonna move in with my girlfriend. What do you mean you're gonna move in? Yeah, we're gonna live together. And at 18, 19 years old, and we were heathens, we weren't Christians, we were far from Christians. No one would have ever looked at me and said, are you a Christian? There would have never been another. Side. And all my friends were the same way. And even as non-Christians, because of the culture, we would say, you're gonna go tell your parents? Oh no, we're not telling them, oh no. No, we're not telling them anything. Because it wasn't culturally accepted back then. Back then, if you were a man and you had an earring, you only had it in your left ear. How many of y'all remember that? Look at it. Because if you had it in your right ear, you were swinging the wrong way. <laughs> Seriously. So if you saw a guy with left ear, you'd like to say, okay, he's cool. <laughs> it was in the other, it's like, oh, dude, what, what, what? We, that was culture. Now today, you can have rings anywhere and everywhere. I mean, back then, we didn't see nose rings. We didn't see multiple earrings or fake, I mean, we never saw something on your tongue. But today, it's normal. Back when then, if we just saw that, it'd have been like, dude, that's the freakiest thing in the world. 
But today you can have rings in your eyebrow. You can have them everywhere. In your nose, on your nose, like a bull ring. Like hook something up and let's go, you know. (laughs) And no one thinks a thing. But back then, that's what I'm saying. See, back then, that's what the culture was. And the culture today is totally different. Back then, our culture was you could cuss like sailors. But even in front of the girls, we didn't cuss that much. It was, just, it was just, no, you don't talk like that in front of them. Today, girls are talking worse than guys. They're like dropping things that back when I was young, was like, what? If a girl talked like that back then, we'd all want to get to know her. <laughs> but today, it's like, that's how people talk. Culture. Yeah, that was bad, wasn't it? I wouldn't, but my friends would. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm trying to say. See, culture affects our judgments. Our judgments, our skills, our preconceived notions, attitude, and emotions. These factors are closely linked with our culture in perceiving something as good or bad. Our biases play a role. And so those of our way of thinking, culture decides what's right and wrong. And judging something is easy or difficult. Our attitude and our motivation levels play a key role. Our culture determines the structure of our thinking, which influences our perceptions. That's why some of us who are getting a little older, we, we look at the world today and say, what's happened? It's just so different. Things that we could say back then that no one would care about. If you say today, it's like, uh uh-oh, that's not culturally normal or right. The hashtag, you know, symbol that we call hashtag was actually, in my day, called the pound symbol. (laughs) So when you think about hashtag me too, it's like, oh, wow, okay, well, you can figure that one out on your own. (laughs) <laughs> Research has shown that our culture plays, does play a role in the way our brain processes information. That's why when you come to church and you hear the word of God and you hear what God's word says, it freaks you out like, oh man, I can't believe you said that. Oh, I can't believe you said that. It's not because it's not in the scriptures, it's because of your cultural bias. It just freaks us out because it's like, it's not, that's, not, that's not part of our culture. This is one reason why culture is so important. Culture affects perception, and perception drives behavior. The culture we belong to, that we buy into, has direct impact on our behavior. What our culture teaches us or lets us know is what is acceptable, what is not acceptable, what is allowed and what is, what is not and it affects the way we interact socially. See, our faith and morals, which are a part of our culture, affect how we behave, and our sense of right and wrong influences our feelings, such as shame and pride. If we think it's wrong and we do it, it's, it's shame. And our faith dictates our behavior. Culture can also be called, if you would, at times, traditions. The Bible will say the traditions of men the way they do things compared to the way that God wants us to do things. This is the clash that we have. Culture affects everything. Listen to Colossians chapter 2, because I know there's someone in here saying, is he ever going to read the Bible? <laughs> I get complaints sometimes like, you didn't read enough scripture. Like, how many do I need to read for it to be okay? I said all that so I could get to this so that we would understand what, what we're talking about. Listen to this. Colossians chapter 2, 6 through 12. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. I love this scripture. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught and and you will overflow with thankfulness. When you grow in God, you become more thankful. When you're not thankful, you're not growing in God. And then I love this. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers. He's talking about the demons and demonic activity of this world rather than from Christ. 
For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ, buried with Christ when you were baptized. And with him you were raised a new life to a new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Paul was a gifted philosopher, so he wasn't, he wasn't condemning philosophy, he is condemning teaching that credits humanity, not Christ, with being the answer to all life's problems. We must resist heresy. There are so many man-made approaches to life, problems that totally disregard God and our culture says just educate him, just give him more teaching, educate him, educate him, educate him. If you educate him on the, how bad DUI is and people won't do it, but yet we're one of the worst in the country. It's gotta be a heart change. That's what'll change culture, that's what'll change people. In the culture of Christ, we are called to forfeit our rights. And today we live in a culture that is based on my rights, what I deserve, what I should get. But we are called to live Christ's way. The fight we fight each and every day is a cultural one. Mark 8, verses 34 through 36, Jesus says, then calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Again, by Jesus saying, or using the cross as an example, illustration, of the ultimate submission required of his followers. We need to understand that they knew exactly what he was talking about because a prisoner carried his own cross to the place where they were gonna be executed, signifying submission to Roman power and authority. That once that person carried the cross, everybody knew when they were walking, they were walking dead man or dead woman. They were, they, they, they were gonna be crucified. Unless they got pardoned by Rome, which didn't happen hardly ever, they knew they were in it. They weren't getting out of it. And Jesus is using that example to say, when you follow me, you can't be thinking, I'm going backwards or I'm going to be distracted. He said, when you pick up your cross, you follow me wherever I take you. That means when my culture conflicts with your culture, you change your culture. And you come to mine. And that's where the divide is. This is the way I was raised. This is who we are. This is the people. We put labels over being a believer and a follower. We put our own interests over being a follower of Christ. That's why our world's in such a mess. It's a cultural fight you're fighting. The culture of Christ is to understand that when we accept Jesus and his salvation, we are no longer living for ourselves but for God. See, we must be careful not to allow the culture of this world to be stronger in us. It's so funny when I was writing this, I had this thought when I, as soon as I wrote it down, that word stronger in us, I thought, man, that's a Star Wars thing. The force is strong with you, <laughs> strong in you. I thought, man, but if this world to be stronger in us than the love and the culture of Christ, that's where your conflict is. First John chapter 2, 15, 17 says, do not love or cherish the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, craving for sensual gratification, and the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life. Some, some translation says, um, instead of pride of life, obsession with status and importance. This Amplified says, in the pride of life, assurance in one's own resources, or in the stability of earthly things. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world itself. And the world passes away and disappears. And with it, the forbidden cravings, the passionate desires, the lust of it. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purposes in his life abides and remains forever. 
One of the clearest examples of a culture clash can be in marriage. In fact, it's one of many reasons that marriages break up today. Because say you came from a family where you talked about everything, like everything was talked about, and you talked it all out. We just talk, talk, talk. And then you come from a family that we didn't talk about anything. I mean, in my family, we didn't talk about a whole lot. I mean, my dad's sex talked to me when I was 15 years old. He came into my room, opened the door one night, and looked at me and said, Steve, don't make me have to buy you a bus ticket. <laughs> I'm looking at him like, because I'm in there reading, I'm like, what? He said, you know what I, you know what, you heard what I said. I said, well, what is that? He goes, you know what I mean. And it took me, I'm like, what? He said, don't make me have to buy you a bus ticket, boy, to get you out of town. And I'm thinking, well, that was a sex talk. In other words, don't get a girl pregnant and me have to give you a bus ticket to get you out of town. That's how much that was talk was. That, it lasted about that long. And I didn't even understand it at first. But then you come from families where people talk about anything and everything. And then you get married. And one of your spouses wants to talk about things. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. And you're like, I don't want to talk about nothing. We don't talk about things in my world. And they're like, well, I'm sorry. You don't want to talk to me? No, I don't want to talk to you now or ever. <laughs> Can't we just be happy and just go along? But I want you to hear me. I don't want to hear you. See, that's the clash. And so you, what you have to do when you bring two cultures together, you have to develop your own culture. That's what happens in families when you marry somebody and you get married and your family pulls on you and says, well, you're going to spend Christmas with us, aren't you? No, we're going to do our own thing. No, you're not. They shame you. This is the way we do things. We all spend it together. Yeah, but I got my own family. That's why the man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. Well, God is saying, you're establishing your own family. So in-laws get out of their life. Stay out. And if they don't want to come to you at Christmas, give them their Christmas presents early or whatever, whatever. But see, we, we don't like it. So when you get out of someone's culture, they try to bring you back in. That's the fights we have. When you become a believer in Christ, some of your families come against you, your friends. It's because they don't understand the culture change in your mind and what's going on. When I came to Christ, I had to change everything about my life. The way I talked, the way I thought, the way I, whatever. I, I mean, everything. It wasn't, there wasn't nothing I didn't need to change. And I had to decide. I didn't even think like this. Is it my way or God's way? Am I going to hang on to things just because this is our family? I mean, I see young people today, they're going to college and their family gives them a hard time. Like, we don't go to college. We're not those kind of people. Yeah, but that's, what they're saying is, this is our culture and I don't want you to get out of it. But at some point, you got to stand on your own. When I first got saved, that's how my mom was. You're in a cult. My dad could care less. He wasn't spiritual at all. He just thought I was being stupid. <laughs> but my mom was concerned because she knew she thought I was in a cult. She tried to get my brother to take me out even drinking. Just get him out. He's in a cult. Because my whole life was changing. And it wasn't the norm. Culture is culture, folks. You know, when I came to New Mexico, back to New Mexico, I hung out with Savino Sanchez, who's one of the board members there. Great human being. Great friend. And I got to know his family. And he had like 12 siblings. And I got to know his mom and dad real well. And when you'd go to their house, because they would have all these times where they'd get together and eat, and it wasn't a big house, but they would come there and eat, he would always invite me and my wife. And so when I would walk in there, I would watch their culture. I wouldn't have called it culture back then, but I was watching it. And when one family member would come in, whether it was a nephew, a niece, an uncle, a brother, sister, whatever, they would greet everybody in the house. And so I'm standing there like, okay, when you're in Rome, do what the Romans do. So I'm like, okay, that's how you do it. And then I would greet everybody. I'd walk by and greet everybody. And then when they would leave, they would all do the same thing. So when we'd leave, I said, wait a minute, Cindy, we got to greet everybody. I don't care if there's 20 or five, we got to greet them. And so I just began to do that. I do that to this day. That's culture. And then Savino's mom died. And his dad was Savino also. And we go to their house after the funeral. And they look at me and they said, Pastor Steve, go sit by my dad. And I'm like, well, well the ladies can sit. They said, no, Pastor Steve, just go sit. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. You ladies can go sit down. I'll stand. They said, Pastor Steve, you don't understand. If you don't go sit by me, you'll offend him. Go have a seat. So I sat down. 
And then these ladies brought me my food. <laughs> I'm looking around like, what's happening here? I saw the kids had been fed and they were feeding all the men. The wives of the husbands that were there were preparing, all the men were sitting and they prepared all, they, they, the men, they, the, the women brought them their food. I'm looking at this like, what's happening here? Well, they said, we're honoring my dad because this is the way he grew up. This was his culture. And I'm like, I got to eat. And they came and said, you want some more? And I said, yes. <laughs> and they brought me some more. And so now I'm, my wife is sitting next to me and I'm like, because all the women are standing up against the wall. Not one of the women were sitting. And I'm like, I'm looking at my wife like, Because I like that culture. And she said, don't even think about it, Steve. I'm not going to do that. But I'm like, this is pretty cool culture. But that's the way he was raised. They wanted to honor him because his wife just passed away. That's culture. Some people have a culture in their house where you, you walk in, you take off your shoes. Now, that's odd to me because in my house, we just wear our shoes. But I've gone to people's house. I still do this day. They said, would you please remove your shoes? So you just move. Why? It's their culture. It's different for me but it's their culture. So if you got smelly feet, you don't wanna to go to people's houses like that, man. You're like, you're like, please, I'll just stay outside. Are we getting it? Culture is how you live, how you do things. We have a culture in here. When you come in here, you can't act a fool. We have security that will assist you. I told my wife when she designed this, I said, you know, the foyer, make it loud where people can get loud and have fun and be comfortable. But I want this decorated in a way where when people walk in, it's like, oh, it's more reverent. I want it when people, strangers come in or people that don't know us, when they come in, new people, they come in and say, oh, man, we're not going to goof off in this house. She said, okay. That's our culture. Culture drives everything. And when you come to Christ, you have a culture. And then you have to change your culture and be willing to. That's what he says. Be, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What he's saying is you've got to change cultures. That's the fight we have. Well, this is the way my family, this is the way I was raised. And God says, yeah, but I want you to do it this way. He wants to break some of those things so you can have Christ's culture living and abiding in you. Families have culture, the way they do things, the way they operate. When it comes to culture, you hear people say, this is just the way we do things here. There's no rhyme or reason. It's like the lady who cut off the end of her ham before she baked it. And the daughter looked at her, she's teaching the daughter how to do this, we cut off the end of our ham. And the daughter said, mom, why do you cut off the end of your ham? She said, well, that's the way my mom taught me to do it. Yeah, but why? She goes, I don't know why. This is just the way we do it. So she called her mom and said, mom, why do we cut off the end of the ham? And the mom said, because it wouldn't fit in the pan. <laughs> you can get into trouble at work when you violate the culture. And when you're new to a place, you say, I didn't know. You got to learn the culture. You'll hear people say, when I come from this place, this is how we did things. It might be good, but it may not be how someone else does things. Every family has a culture. Every professional team has a culture. Sports team. Every company has a culture. Every church has a culture. Culture really does trump everything. You know, it's funny, when I got married, before I got married, I'd hang out with my brother, my oldest brother all the time and his family, and I was single, so I usually went over there at dinner time. So I ate with them all the time because I was single, and I knew where to get a good meal because they, my sister-in-law could cook. And I'd go hang out with my family and my brother and his family, his kids, and, and his wife all the time. I was over there all the time because I, when you're single, you go where the food is. And... And when I got married, my brother was a little upset with me. He said, you never come over anymore. You never 
You never come by? I said, yeah, yeah, Brian, because I got married. My life is changing. He said, well, you think, you know, you just think, you know, you're too good now? And I said, no, I got a woman. <laughs> and she has things that I like. <laughs> and I want to be with her. She cooks for me now. And then he started laughing and goes, ah, that's true, man. I didn't think about it like that. I just figured you didn't want to be around us anymore. I said, no, I, I still like you, but I really like her. <laughs> See, you're breaking culture. And sometimes when you break from family culture, friend, whatever the culture is, people don't like it because now they don't know how to relate to you. But if you want to walk with Christ, you got to do it right. You know, when I lived in Tehran, Iran, I close with this. When we lived in Tehran, Iran, one of the first things that happened when we were there, we went to a place called Gulf District where all the Americans hung out. There was no American bases. We were military. We just lived out in the middle of Tehran, Iran. And so it was my older brother who was about 17. My sister was 16. My other brother would have been about 15. I would have been 12, and my younger brother would have been 10. We were out getting a cab because that's how you got around there. We couldn't drive. You couldn't drive unless you were at least 21 as an American, so or if you're in the military, but so we couldn't, he couldn't drive like he could in America, so we had to take taxi cabs everywhere. So he's standing out there doing this with the taxi cab. You know, this is how you hitchhike in America. How many of y'all know that? You know, that's what people do. They hitchhike like this. And so, so anyway, he's out there doing that and no one's stopping. In fact, people are yelling at us and honking, and screaming at us. And we're like, what is going on here? But no one would stop. Finally, this Iranian who knew English, he pulled over and said, hey, are you guys new here? And he goes, yeah, we just got here, man. He goes, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to get a cab, but none of them will stop. And he said, well, you know why? We said, no, we don't know why. He said, this in Iran is the bird finger in America. <laughs> so you are flipping off everybody driving by. <laughs> We're like, what? Culture. And so he said, well, how do I flag a cab? He goes, with your finger like this. <laughs> so he left. My brother did this, and sure enough, a cab driver pulled right over, picked us up, and we went home. <laughs> when you don't understand God's culture, it will cost you more than you're willing to pay. And when you refuse to change yours for his, you'll be out on a limb by yourself. And then you'll always wonder, why isn't no one stopping? Why isn't nobody helping? Why is everybody treating me like this? You'll always wonder those things. Thank God people can stop by your life and say, if you'll do it this way, then you'll receive God's blessing. It is up to you which culture you adapt to. For me and my house, we're going to purpose to adapt to God's culture. What about you and your house? And everything's on the table to change, to please our Lord and Savior. That's what we should say. God, when we say, teach me your ways, he said, okay, I'm going to change everything in your life, maybe, that needs to be changed. Are we willing to change culture? Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for teaching us. I thank you for helping us all. Father, help us renew our thinking to your thinking. Help us realize it's really a cultural clash because today in this culture, there's so many things that are so wrong and bad. So many things that when I grew up was, was okay and normal, now today they're not. Because the culture trumps everything. And as we walk with you, we have to develop Christ's culture. What is the culture? How should we live? How should we think? How should we talk? How shall we do with what we have? Culture even dictates what we do with our money, God. It's all about culture. Help us renew our minds to your ways. Show us so we can make changes and be open. Because ultimately, we get to choose. It's our choice. But there is a cultural clash that we fight with. It's called the good fight of faith. And may we submit our ways to your ways. The Word of God teaches in Isaiah 55 that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We have to decide whose thoughts and whose ways we're going to develop in our lives. It's everybody's choice. 
hopefully we'll make a choice this year to say, God, I want your culture in my life. Because that's the way it's going to, I'm going to live. That's the way I'm going to think and talk. That's how my biases will be in my perception. Teach us, Lord, your ways. And be merciful always. In Jesus' name. If you're here with every head bowed and you say, Pastor, listen, I need to give my life to the Lord today and I'm ready. And I realize now, I get it, man. I, I see it so clearly. I've been fighting this fight. Didn't even know what to call it, but now I've defined it. And I can win this. I can do this right now. It's just me changing, and it's hard to change sometimes, but I get it. It's, it's my culture versus God's culture, and I, I want to yield myself more. And so I need to come home and get it right so I can walk with God again. Or if you're here and you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I've never given Christ my life with the intention to follow him anyway. And I'm ready to give him permission. And I'm ready to fight this cultural warfare, this cultural clash that, that is inevitable. And I will learn God's ways. And I will honor him. I'll make sure he has my heart. If that's you and you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I'm going to pray with you right now. And I want you to pray this prayer that I'm going to pray with you out loud. Loud enough for your ears to hear your voice. And I want everybody in here that's right with God, that's been praying for those people, I want you to pray with us. So no one's praying alone. We'll all pray this prayer together. But if you need to get your life right, if you need to come to the Lord, if you need to give him permission in your life, would you pray this prayer? I'm leading you to Christ. I'm not, I can't save you. This church can't save you. No church can. Belonging to a group can't save you. It's you believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus that will change your life forever. And God will circumcise your heart so that you can walk with him. Would you pray this prayer with me aloud? Would you pray, Father? I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe he's your son. And I believe on the third day you raised him from the dead to give me new life. So with all my heart today, I choose to believe. And with my mouth, I willingly confess, Jesus, be Lord of my life. I want to thank you for saving me. I want to thank you for forgiving me. I will renew my thinking to be in line with your word. Teach me, O oh God, your ways. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord real good one time. You know, there's a song that the kids sing, with, whether you're red, yellow, black, or white, we're all precious in God's sight. What do you think that's saying? It doesn't, God never separated people by the color of their skin. He's separated by are you believer or not believer. So if you're